Autocracy is nothing new, but it has a postmodern version, replete with the following characteristics. Number one, the trappings of a democracy. There are elections, institutional checks and balances, multi-party systems, media, which are essentially subservient and dominated by the regime. All these are the embellishments of democracy, empty and hollowed out. This is the first characteristic. Number two, an affiliation with a global network of other authoritarian, totalitarian, tyrannical and dictatorial regimes. And this network, this affiliation, this club of autocracies cross-promote the members' agendas and interests. Everyone is helping everyone in a variety of settings, military, political, geopolitical, internal and external. And number three, a vehement and hateful rejection of the values of liberal democracy and what is called the left, especially pluralism, sexual, gender and social freedoms, free speech and the peaceful transition of power. My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning and the topic of today's video is autocracy, its social and psychological roots and its current incarnation. The historical fact is that American coercive meddling has given rise, created and restored autocracy as an alternative political and geopolitical organizing principle coupled with a value system. Suffice it to mention countries like South Vietnam, which has been taken over by the communist North, Russia after Yeltsin and today under Putin, and Afghanistan, now again in the hands of the Taliban. In all three places, America's footprint, heavy-handed, has led to the emergence of an autocracy as a response and a defense. Seemingly incapable of learning from its mistakes, the United States is currently repeating the same self-defeating pattern in Israel, Venezuela and a host of other polities. Now, autocrats, the people at the head of the autocracy, the dictators, the tyrants, they perceive democracy and Western decadence as symptoms of an incurable and inexorable effeteness, a weakness, a vulnerability, even a disease. With narcissism on the rise, such vulnerabilities are widely derided and decried in populist movements. What's the solution? Strong men. Strong men are touted as the panacea to all the ills of the failed progressive project. Autocracy is highly performative. It's a, it's a performance art and it fits well with Guy Debord's society of the spectacle. It leverages the emergence of social media, conspiracism and conspiracy theories and fake news. And so autocracy is a contemporary phenomenon. I'm reminded of this quote. Even though autocracy is, as I said, a contemporary phenomenon, it had its roots long ago. De Coustin, writing about Russia in the mid 19th century, had this to say, I came here to see a country, but what I find is a theater. In appearances, everything happens as it does everywhere else. There is no difference, except in the very foundations of things. The spectacular aspect of autocracy, the performative dimension of a tyrannical regime, these are age old. The new variants the postmodern renditions and disguises of autocracy are contemporary. 
Six decades ago, the Polish-American Jewish author Jerzy Koszynski wrote, or maybe compiled, <laughs> the book Being There. The book describes the election to the presidency of the United States of a simpleton, a simple-minded gardener whose vapid and trite pronouncements are taken to be sagacious and penetrating insights into human affairs. The being there syndrome is now manifest throughout the world, from Russia, where you have the likes of Putin, to the United States, Obama, Trump. Given a high enough level of frustration, triggered by recurrent endemic and systemic failures in all spheres of policy and life, even the most resilient democracy develops a predilection to strong men, leaders whose charismatic self-confidence sang foi, an apparent omniscience, all but guarantee, so to speak, a change of course, and any change of course would be for the better, because thing, things can get worse. These are usually, these leaders are usually people with a thin resume in politics, having accomplished little prior to their ascendance. They appear to have erupted on the scene from nowhere. These people are received as providential messiahs precisely because they are not encumbered with a discernible past, and thus they are ostensibly unburdened by prior affiliations and commitments to the establishment, the swamp. Their only duty is to a nebulous and shape-shifting horizon. These leaders are ahistorical, they have no history and they're above history. They are, in many ways, history reified, at least in their own eyes. Indeed, it is precisely this apparent lack of biography that qualifies these leaders to represent and bring about a fantastic and grandiose future. They act as a blank screen upon which the multitudes project their own traits, wishes, personal biographies, needs, fantasies, dreams, and yearnings. The more these leaders deviate from their internal promises uh, and initial pledges, the more they fail, the more dear they are to the hearts of their constituents. Why? Because psychopathologies resonate. When you break your promises, when you fail, it means that you are normal average, common. The constituents of these leaders keep saying, the leader is like me. This new chosen guide and guru is struggling, coping, trying and failing, and like me, he has his shortcomings and vices. And this affinity is endearing and captivating. It helps to form a shared psychosis, a folia plusieurs between ruler and people, and it fosters the emergence of a hagiography. The propensity to elevate narcissistic or even psychopathic personalities to power is most pronounced in countries that lack a democratic tradition, countries like China or Russia or Hungary, or the nat nations that inhabit the territories that once belonged to Byzantium or the Ottoman Empire, for example. Cultures and civilizations which frown upon individualism and have a collectivist tradition, prefer to install strong collective leaderships rather than strong men and definitely over any variant of democracy. Yet all these polities maintain a theater, an appearance of democracy, a theater of democratically reached consensus, Putin has a name for it, sovereign democracy. Such charades are devoid of essence and proper function. They are replete with, um, with personality cults, concurrent with the adoration of a party or some governing elite in power. And the network of benevolent and venal patronage guarantees long-term allegiance and loyalty. 
In most developing countries and nations in transition, democracy is an empty word. Granted, the hallmarks of democracy are there. All these countries have candidate lists, parties, election propaganda, a plurality of media, and voting, and so on and so forth. But the quiddity is absent. The essence of democracy is missing. It is decontextualized. The democratic principles and institutions are being consistently hollowed out and rendered mock by election fraud, exclusionary policies, cronyism, nepotism, corruption, intimidation, and collusion with interests, both commercial and political, inside and outside the country. The new so-called democracies are thinly disguised thinly veiled and criminalized plutocracies. Plutocracies. Recall, for example, the Russian oligarchs. These are authoritarian regimes. Have a look at the countries of Central Asia and the Caucasus. These are puppeteered hierarchies. Look at Iran, Bosnia, Iraq. These are all, they all claim to be democracies, <laughs> in even North Korea. The new democracies suffer from many of the same ills that afflict their veteran role models. All democracies, all democracies display dysfunctionalities in pathogenic and pathological processes. For example, murky campaign finance, venal revolving doors between state administration and private enterprise, endemic corruption, nepotism, and cronyism, self-censoring media, socially, economically, and politically excluded minorities, and so on and so forth. These are as common in the United States as they are, for example, in China. The malaise threatens the foundations of even the likes of the United States and France. Something is innately and inherently wrong in the very concept of democracy. Possibly, it's an ideal that defies human nature itself. Many nations have chosen prosperity over democracy. Yes, the denizens of these realms cannot speak their mind. They cannot protest. They cannot criticize. They cannot even joke, lest they be arrested or worse. But in exchange for giving up these trivial freedoms, they have food on the table. They're fully employed. They receive ample health care, retirement benefits, and proper education. They save and spend to their heart's content. In return for all these Confucian worldly and intangible goods, popularity of the leadership, which yields political stability, prosperity, security, prestige, abro prestige abroad, authority at home, a renewed sense of direction, nationalism, collective, community, etc., etc. These are all intangible goods, but very important, this sense of stability and safety and certainty. So in return for all these Confucian goods, the citizens of these countries forego the right to be able to criticize the regime or to change it once every four years. And many in these countries insist that they have struck a good bargain, not a Faustian one. The only threat to most autocracies is the intergenerational transmission of power in an environment increasingly more suffused with pathological narcissism and psychopathy. By definition, leaders are authority figures. And as authority figures, as such, they stand in for one's parental figures, especially the father in patriarchal and traditionalist societies. Old school psychoanalysts would tell you that such a substitution is bound to provoke one's latent Oedipus complex and the proclivity for patricide. Uh, patricide, whether actual in the form of assassination or symbolic in the form of dissent and disdainful criticism. Young, Emerging leaders, more often than not, treat their predecessors this way, as hated father or parent figures. This is especially true when the new or young leader's childhood has been marked by the traumas wrought on by an absent or an abusive father, as is much more common nowadays than ever. 
and this pernicious undercurrent often mixes unsettlingly with virulent envy, the outcome of deep-seated feelings of inferiority and insecurity. The less self-regulated the new or young leader's sense of self-worth, the more he or she resorts to narcissistic defenses and the more he or she compulsively seeks narcissistic supply, attention, adulation. And all this is in order to buttress their person precariously balanced personalities. Narcissism is frequently tinged with sadism and passive-aggressive behaviors, taunting the older or previous leader, publicly humiliating him or her, thus showing him or her who is boss. The more successful the new or young leader is at defeating or subjugating his or her predecessors, the more it supports their belief in their own omnipotence, omniscience, and cosmic messianic sense of mission. Every manner of psychological defense mechanism is provoked in the young leader. Denial of the inappropriateness, impudence, and immorality of his actions. Devaluation of the old leadership, thus justifying their mistreatment. Displacement, scapegoating the previous leaders for one's own predicament and failures. Fantasy, evading reality by constructing elaborate, grandiose narratives and confabulations. Idealization of the nation, for instance, or of one's own coterie or uh, followers or political party. Omnipotence, projection, attributing to the former leader, uh, leaders one's own faults, uh, frailties and shortcomings and mistakes. Projective identification, provoking the older leaders into action that is unseemly or against their best interests. Rationalization and intellectualization of one's misconduct and misdeeds as a young leader. Splitting, casting the older erstwhile leaders as evil, corrupt and incompetent while attributing to oneself all the positive traits and so on and so forth. It's a, psycho, it's a psychodrama. The intergenerational transition or transmission of power in autocracies is a psychodrama. The end result of such a clash is often a civil war, or at the very least, decimating civil unrest. This is the end point of most autocracies. Two, there is a transfer of power from one autocracy to the next, or from autocracy to democracy. Intergenerational transmission, the emergence of a young as challengers, as usurpers, as disruptors, this is critical. There's not Democracy does not stand a chance unless young people are there to impose it on the outgoing autocrat and his milieu. And yet, the youth of today are opting out of the political and social game and the public square. They are not participating in the life of any collective. The smallest, a family, a couple, they are solipsistic, anatomized. They are not even rebels, because rebellion is a form of participation. The young today merely seek to sabotage the established order via avoidance, virtue signaling and self-aggrandizing morality plays, with obstructive, obstructive withdrawal and passive-aggressive resistance. The young today constitute a new phenomenon, the avoidant revolutionary. In their ostentatious absence spells the perpetuation and ascendance of autocracy over democracy.